In this lesson, we're going to look at salvation. According to Charles C. Rory's book, Basic Theology, on page 277, he states, Soteriology is the doctrine of salvation. It must be the greatest theme in the scriptures. It embraces all of time as well as eternity past and future. It relates in one way or another to all of mankind without exception. It even has ramifications in the spheres of the angels. It is the theme of both the Old and the New Testament. It is personal, national, and cosmic, and it centers on the greatest person, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's look at it from the standpoint of sozo, which is Greek, which is a, a embellishment of the understanding of the word salvation, which means it's deliverance, preservation, restoration, safety, soundness, and healing. May I suggest as a real student of the Word of God that you research the word sozo, S-O-Z-O, and see what it means to you, and you may have a bigger and broader understanding of the word of salvation. And Dr. Tom, would you please read Ephesians 1, 3 through 8, and that will give us a better understanding of the word of salvation. Ephesians 1, 3 through 8. Blessed be the God of our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be a holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to be the adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. There are eight major doctrines that explains the one word, salvation. Regeneration is probably the one that we hear the most about, and that's a changed nature. Adoption, a changed position. Justification, a changed standing. Imputation, a changed account. Sanctification, a changed character. Reconciliation, a changed relationship. Propitiation, the substitutionary death of Christ. Redemption, we're brought believers back from sin. Have you noticed the tense verb of these is past tense? This is something that God has done for us as believers. So these are great major doctrines. They're actually volumes have been written from scholars on each of these and many others, but I would suggest that as a good biblical counselor, look into these and see what they really mean. Now, I think it'll help you in your counseling. There are three phases of salvation. Phase one, we're saved from sin's penalty. And Dr. Tom, would you come and read us the verification from the scriptures why we're saved from sin's penalty? Ephesians 2.5. Please follow along with me on the screen. When we were dead in our sins and our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Titus 3.5. Jesus has saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 7.25 Therefore, Jesus is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since Jesus always lives to make intercession for you and I and those in the future today. John 10, 28 and 29. I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. 
Jesus is speaking, and he says, My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Ephesians 2.8 For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a free gift of God, lest any man would boast. Hebrews 7.25 Therefore Jesus is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. John 5, 24, and Jesus is speaking, and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes on him, the Father, who sent me, has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. 1 Peter, the big fisherman writes in 1, 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The three phases of salvation, this is phase number two. It's the deliverance over the present reigning power of sin in the Christian's life. And we'll start by verifying that with the scriptures in Romans 8.2. Dr. Tom, would you begin reading those scriptures for us, please? Romans 8.2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, who has set you free from the law of sin and death. Galatians 2, 19 through 20. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Galatians 3, 13 through 14. Jesus Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Jesus Christ the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Philippians 2, 12-13 So then, my, bro my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as is in my presence only, but... Now, much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we should always give thanks to God for you. Brethren, be loved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification, by the Holy Spirit, and faith in the truth. Now, phase three of salvation. This is the big one. At the rapture, all believers will be given a glorified, resurrected body. And Dr. Tom, would you verify that with the scriptures, because this should make us happy. Romans 8, 29. Follow along on your screen with me, and this does make me happy. For those whom he knew, he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that which 
also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on, I press on for the goal, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 1 John 3 through 2. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like Christ Jesus, because we will see him just as he is. Ephesians 1, 1 through 13. Paul writes, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful in Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from our God the Father and to the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Jesus, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be a holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to the adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in love. In him, we have redemption through Jesus' blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, he made us to know the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with the view of an suitable time of the fulfillness of this time that is the summing up of all things in Christ Jesus, things in the heavens, things that are on earth. And in him we also have obtained an inheritance which has been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will to the end that we who were first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also have listening to the message of truth, to the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. The faith-based Christian counselor, let's look at this for just a moment. He is to bring help to friends, family, co-workers, and fellow Christians by experiencing freedom by the power of the Holy Spirit. He will teach them and actually be a mentor to them to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh by the renewing of the mind and by making application to that. So let's look at Romans 12 too. It's a very familiar scripture. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Jesus is the answer. As Frank Schwartz has said, Jesus is always the answer. It's good. He's the answer for the saved. And he's the answer for the lost. So using the word of God, the counselor presents Jesus Christ as the answer. The counselor refers to the Bible as the resource book. And the counselor provides a biblically based information and answers and not opinions. The faith-based Christian counselor, here are some of the issues that will come in the counseling relationship. Anger, bitterness, guilt, sexual abuse resentment, unforgiveness, depression, marriage problems, and eating disorders such as anorexia and bulimia. So these are some things that you might want to look into and just do some research for yourself. What is anorexia and what is bulimia? And the goal. What is the goal? Well, if you went to Bible college, they would call it progressive sanctification of the believer. But here it is in plain English. We're using the Word of God for the transformation of the soul if they are a believer. So what's the soul? It's the mind, the will, and the emotions. So if the Christian is a Christian, okay, and the Spirit 
is perfect because they accepted Christ and that is made perfect according to the word of God, then the soul is being transformed according to Romans 12, 2. And the result will be a transformation into the image of Christ. And there's freedom in Christ. And there's a emancipation from bondage. So I'm going to ask Dr. Tom if he would read 2 Corinthians 3, 15 through 18, please. Follow with me now as we read 2 Corinthians 3, 15 through 18. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror to the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Therefore, in 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 5, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adultery of the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God, and even in our gospel is veiled, it is the veil to those who are perishing. But in the case of the God, that's a little g, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but we preach Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as bondservants for Jesus' sake. So what is God's plan? It's progressive sanctification. So it's a work of God, not of human counselors. The Holy Spirit uses the Word of God, and the process is transformed according to God's plan, not the counselor nor the client. And here's the counseling process. And this is very, very important that you get this point because this is one of the major points of this lesson is the counseling process. Number one, to encourage help, hope, and healing. And by the way, those are the three H's that we talk about often in our training. Two, to pinpoint sin by the Holy Spirit. Three, to teach biblical principles that apply to the problem or problems that come in the counseling relationship. Four, to assign outside projects. Five, to be accountable. Six, to provide prayer support. And seven, to refer when appropriate. And you often hear us say, of refer, refer, refer. It's no shame to refer your client out to someone who can help them better than you. In fact, it's smart on a physician to refer you out to a specialist if you have some kind of serious health issue that he's unable to deal with. So, be sure to refer out to somebody who can help the client because it's not about you, it's about helping the client. There are four provisions of God, and I'm going to ask Dr. Tom if he will read Romans 8, 29, and James 5, 16, and a couple of other scriptures dealing with these four provisions of God. Please follow along as we look at the four provisions of God. Romans 8, 29. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins one to another, and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The effective prayers of a righteous man or woman accomplishes much. Philippians 1.6 
For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Timothy, the third chapter in the 16th through 17th verse says this, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. Help, hope, and healing, the three H's that we talk about often in our counseling training. The counselor utilizes the power of God to achieve the purposes of God by applying biblical principles and providing help, hope, and healing. And the result is victory over our sinful flesh. And Christ Jesus is the answer. Jesus is our model. He counseled with perfect knowledge. That's Colossians 2.3. He knew men needed salvation. John 3.3. 3. He counseled graciously and tactfully in John 4.18. And he counseled gently and courteously in Luke 12.15. So let's look at Jesus here as he counsels in these different scriptures as Dr. Tom reads these scriptures to us. Jesus, the counselor. Many of these scriptures which we have been reading are vital to your Christian walk and growth in life. I want to encourage you not only to read them on the screen, but to mark them in your Bible. Make special note and go back to them, refer to them often as you are a Christian counselor, and you'll need to write these on your heart and your mind. Join me now in Colossians 2.3. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? John 3.3 says... Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 4, 18. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This I said to you truly. Luke 12, 15. Then Jesus said to them, Beware. And be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. So, how shall we counsel as Christian counselors? Well, we counsel the same way that Jesus did in those scriptures that was in your hearing. Perfect knowledge? Well, the Word of God is perfect knowledge. Salvation? Every client needs salvation. And how about graciously and tactfully? Would we want that? If we came into a counseling session with someone, would we want the counselor to be gracious and to approach us tactfully? I think so. And how about gently and courteously? Remember, that's what Jesus did, and he is our model. Jesus counseled according to needs. There needs to be a change if our walk does not line up with our talk, according to the Word of God. In my quiet time study some years ago, I came came across this quote, and I I think it really speaks to us. Your talk talks, and your walk walks or talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Let me read that again. Your talk talks, and your walk talks. But your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Is that you? Is that me? Let's check our hearts. Jesus is the example. In 1 John 2, 6, he says, The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And the one being counseled as well as the counselor will begin to act like Christ in thought, word, and deed, as both follow Christ. The effective counseling. Are you called? Are people drawn to you? Do people talk to you easily? Do you need to get certified as Christian counseling? Do you need to get a degree? Do you need both? At the Institute, we provide both of those for you. And how about major types of counseling? There's the informal and there's the formal. Many times 
we'll do counseling on the fly as we go. Maybe between uh, Sunday school and church. Somebody will want to pull you aside and talk about an issue in their lives. Or perhaps in an informal setting, you might meet somebody for a cup of coffee and talk about some issues. But in the formal setting, that is that you'll make an appointment and somebody will come into your office in a formal setting where you sit down and you do some serious counseling in a more formal setting. So there's two types of counseling and I suggest that you know both of those is the informal as you're on, go, as you're on the go and then the formal setting that you would do in your office. And there's counseling skills. Compassion is feeling with the ones that we counsel. And please, please avoid saying things like, oh, you poor thing, you've really been wronged. It has been said that people don't care how much we know until they know what, how much we care. Do we act like we care for them? Do we really minister to them? Do we give them the word of God? So, here are some basic principles for the Christian counselor to understand and know and to put into their lives. Number one, identify with them. Put yourself in their shoes. How would you feel if you had to make an appointment with somebody and dis discuss the things that's going on in your life? And then number two, thank God for wisdom in order to discern the real problem. I've often said this, the problem is not the problem. You'll only deal and get into the real problem once they come in and you ask the Holy Spirit to reveal those problems to you as the counselor. And number three, look together at biblical-based options. Or you're going to help them, guide them, but not give them all the answers, but you want to give them some to get them started. And then you develop, number four, a core plan based on Scripture. So, here's what James 1 says. And Dr. Tom, would you do that? James 1.5 but if any of you, that's me included, lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives wisdom to all generously, without reproach, and it will be given to each one of us who ask. The counseling experience in the atmosphere of positive expectation for help, hope, and healing. This is very, very important that when they come into your office, if you have an office where they're coming in to see you, have relaxing music on. Have the room uh, clear of clutter where they can come in and relax and to see you. Remember, a lot of people are anxious just to make the appointment. And then to sit there and wait is even more anxiety for many people when they think about what I'm going to say in this session with somebody I've never met before. So anyway, make it very friendly that the people can relax and come into the counseling relationship with the counselor and be able to tell their problems. The counseling skills continue with identification. Everyone shares the same problem. What is it? It's sin. And we use counselor self-disclosure when appropriate. Now what's the counselor self-disclosure? You're going to learn more about what that really means as you go through our counseling skills. But Basically, when you disclose yourself to somebody, for them to open up and share more with you, the counselor, don't air all your dirty laundry each time you meet them because what they'll determine, maybe they need to pray for you and you need to go get help. So, counseling wisdom, we've already talked about James 1, but if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to us generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. The Holy Spirit gives wisdom to look beyond the symptoms. That's very, very important that you understand to hear from the Holy Spirit as you're doing counseling that you'll see the symptoms because the symptoms, those are the things that drives the person to see you in the first place. I want to give you a quick example here. A very famous football player from my city came to see me several years ago. And if I would mention his name, you probably would know him because he's actually famous throughout the whole United States. So he drove in about an hour and a half to meet me at the point in time. And so, 
Obviously, he wanted to tell me about his problems. Now, part of being a counselor is that you listen for the problem. But on the other hand, as I said before, the problem is not the problem. It's what God uses to bring the person to seek you that they need help, hope, and healing in Jesus. So I listened for a while, and I asked him, would you please do this? Would you say the simple prayer that we prayed, and then whatever you heard the number, I want you to go write it on the board, whatever number that you hear. And the man heard an eight. I said, well, go on the board. I had a large chalkboard, and I said, write down one, two, three, four on one side, and five, six, seven, eight on the other side. I said, there are eight things that God wants to deal with you in your life. And I don't know what those are, so we prayed again, and it was revealed to him those eight things. Now, the reason I'm telling you the story is this, that number eight on his list, the number eight on the list, was what God used to bring him to see me. But there were seven more important things that God wanted to deal with him in his life before we got to number eight. So anyway, be sure to know that the symptom only brings them to you, but not necessarily, not necessarily the root problem. Because there's root and fruit, and bad roots will give you bad fruit. Now, use the model of life. You can use the model of life with guidance of the Holy Spirit to discern the real problem, which is the root, and the Holy Spirit will give you, because He is the Spirit of truth, and He will help you discern what is the real problem. What is the root cause of the symptom that brought the person to see you. Counseling, the Word of God. App, application, apply a redemptive solution. We encourage the one being counseled. We provide a constructive proposal. And we base the proposal or the solution on the Word of God. Now, one of the keys that we use at the Institute is this. We use three by five cards. A three by five card is the scripture that deals with the solution for whatever the issue may be. And on the back side of that card, we write a brief prayer based on the scripture that addresses the person's problem. So actually what we're doing, we're actually talking to God in prayer with God's word to address the issue that the client has. How about freedom? Biblical actions lead to freedom. Now, freedom is being what God has designed us to be. It's not freedom to go out to do what you want to do when you want to do it. But you were made by God and for God until you and I understand that life will never make sense. And that's taken directly from the Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. So what's the application? God's word is the truth. We give them God's alternative to their situation. And the answer is always in the Bible. Christ always has a way out of every situation. He, God, will never give us more than we can bear. And that's 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. So, application continues. We must know specific truths. If we just splash some little neat cliche on them, like, well, just pray about it. Or just turn it over to the Lord. Now, what we do when we say that to somebody that's hurting with life circumstances, we bring them frustration and defeat oftentimes because they've already heard that from somebody between Sunday school and church. Just turn it over to the, just turn it over, sister, to the Lord. So what does Romans 12, 3 say? For through the grace given to me, I say to every one among you, not to think more highly of yourself, then you ought to think. But to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So what's the application as we continue? We become a lifetime student of the Word of God. Just because we're counselors, just because we're degreed or certified 
does not mean that we don't study the Word of God. We need a clear knowledge of the Word of God that is able to heal the disappointments and hurts in life. And Christian counselors must become lifetime students of the Word of God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So what's the application? We speak the truth in love. Sometimes the truth hurts, but it can also heal. This is one of the reasons why we do not always counsel family and close friends. So why wouldn't we do that? Sometimes we don't want to hurt their feelings. Sometimes we don't want to tell them the truth. And that way, if we send them to somebody else, then that third party will tell them the truth. And remember, the truth can make us free. So there are three main points that you need to know, and this will certainly be on your test. Number one, problem. All human problems and hurts are somehow a consequence of sin. Number two, approach. We must have an understanding of the psychology of sin and its consequences. And three, the solution. We apply the redemptive truth of God's word to the sin problem. So we do have problems. Everybody's got problems on some level. But the, the wonderful thing about the word of God, God has already addressed our problems. And in Christ Jesus, he has already solved our problems. So we have to get into the Word of God, we have to understand the Word of God, and we have to apply the Word of God that we may walk in freedom over the sin habits that we have. So I hope that you'll get these points and we'll apply them in our lives, first as counselors, and secondly, to those that God sends to us to help, to give them help, hope, and healing. So, Summary, what is our application to this section of training? We listen attentively to the client. God sent them to us, so treat them as you would treat God. So when you look at the client, think of them as God. We use the Bible to make application in principle or command for help, hope, and healing. And then faithfully pray with and for the client. And next, hold the client accountable to do all the assignments. In which they must do the work to see the counselor. And then we keep on together praising God for the victory because the victory is in Jesus.